Uh, morning everyone and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we've heard about the oldest metal, well one of the oldest metals in the world earlier, being gold. Now we're going to hear about one of the newest or newer metals in the world and being rare earths and how strategic, uh, strategic they are going forward. So, the usual disclaimer. Now we've heard a lot about the Green Revolution with COP26 is on top of everyone's mind at the moment. But in order to achieve a lot of these goals, there's a, there are key, uh, key elements that uh, will make this transition and it's been wind power and electric vehicles. And uh, there's also a lot of talk around solar power obviously, but uh, wind power requires lots of rivers and there's the electric vehicles. Now those big um, wind turbines you see in the sea there, those three megawatt wind turbines each take about two tons of rare elements in them per wind turbine. Now when you hear Germany, the North Sea Power, in, power Initiative, you hear about the, the South Sea Power Initiative in Asia, they're talking about gigawatts and gigawatts of wind power being built uh, going forward and, they, and the Germans are also talking about many gigawatts being built, sort of 20 gigawatts over the next 20 years. They're all going to require these direct drive wind turbines and they all need rare earths. Um, rare earths are um, going to a huge range of, of products, they've been, you know, they've been mindful of the Americans led the way in the, in the 70s and then the Chinese took over in the 90s uh, where they saw this, the strategic relevance of rare earths going forward and they decided to dominate that market. And um, going forward, as I said, I'm going to talk about two re key rare earths here called neodymium and praseodymium which go into permanent magnets which are key, as I said, for wind turbines and, uh, and for electric vehicles. They go into your cell phone as well, they go into consumer electronics, drones, all those things have uh, permanent magnets. But the key, two key drivers are electric vehicles and wind turbines. As you can see, neodymium and praseodymium are only about 35% by volume, but 91% by value currently. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, we can see electric vehicle demand driving um, neodymium and praseodymium. At the moment, in 2020, there was about 60,000 uh, tons mined in the world. We see that going by 2030 up to up to 140,000 tons being required. And there are only very few sources of rares around the world. You know, we've got mountain pass in America, the only mine in, in the US. We've got Linus in Australia, the only mine in Australia. We've got the Chinese, obviously, a little bit of rare mining takes place in India for mineral sands, and we've got Myanmar in China, and we have uh, Rambo, which has a small operation in Burundi. And we also have a very, very large project that I'll talk about in South Africa. As you can see, current Neodymium uh, Presidentium prices for both our projects, Pelabor in South Africa and the Gokara project in Burundi, where we do trial mining, is basically our forecasts and we don't see that uh, they're changing. This is because at, at the end of 2020, we saw the price of neodymium and praseodymium starting to increase quite dramatically. So in uh, sort of um, April last year, we were sitting at about $40,000 a ton. We're now at 110, I think, thousand dollars a ton, uh, some, eight, some 18 months later. What's key about Rainbow going forward is the Palabora project in South Africa. Now, Palabora is a, uh, gypsum, uh, well, two gypsum stacks, which are the result of 50 odd years of hard rock mining by Foscor next door in South Africa. Now, Foscor mined a, a hard rock phosphate with rare earth elements present in, in the hard rock, but not in economic quantities. Foscor then produced uh, concentrate slurry, which was then fed next door to Sassel, the big chemical giant in South Africa, and they produced phosphoric acid. In the production of phosphoric acid, we went through three stages of, of acid production and the residue was deposited on these two stacks that we have there, 38 million tons. We've drilled them, they're very homogeneous in nature and the rare earth grade is sitting at about 0.43% TREO, total rare earth oxides. Now what's critical about this deposit is that you need to compare it to iron and clay deposits in China which is typically produces 80% of the, of the Chinese production. Now iron and clay deposits are similar because they've got very low cost of mining. It's just basically mud, you wash into a channel and you feed it into a pipe, into a process plant. At Pelabora we've got the same um, sort of type of mining where we will, we will, we will sluice this um, gypsum into uh, into a channel, into a pipe and into a process plant. 
and propeller bore is about five to ten times higher grade than your ionic clay deposits. So that's what excited us about the project was the grade. And then secondly, the near the precedent content of the basket. Now there's 17 elements in the rare earth um, basket. Each deposit around the world has different percentages of rare earth in, in their basket, similar to a PGM basket in the platinum group metals. You know, and every PGM basket is slightly different. Same with rare earth. But in, we've got 29% of our basket is in neodymium and presidium, which is our, one of the highest of any basket in the world. Linus in, in Australia, their neodymium and presidium percentage in their basket is probably running at about 22-23%. Mountain Pass in America, $6 billion market cap, their neodymium and presidium percentage is running at 15.5%. So we basically double Mountain Pass here in, uh, in Palabora. So also made us very excited about this project. <coughs> Now, what makes Palabora also very exciting is we believe it's going to be a very low capital intensity project. And the reason being is that, as I mentioned earlier, these are gypsum stacks. It's above the ground and all 38 million tonnes will be processed by Rainbow. Um, we don't have to do any hard rock mining and hauling. We would be doing hydraulic mining uh, um, of, of, this, um, of this gypsum into a sluice, but we've got no stockpiles, we've got no crushing and milling which a typical rare earth project needs, hard rock deposit. We don't have multi-stage flotation using also energy and reagents to produce a, a concentrate. All rare earth projects produce a concentrate first and then they start going downstream to produce a mixed rare earth carbonate. And from a mixed rare earth carbonate or a mixed rare earth oxide, they go and um, do separated rare earth oxide, which is the next stage downstream. Um, and various projects around the world are going to, some projects are just producing a concentrate, other projects are looking at a mixture of carbonate, and there's one or two projects talking about going further downstream to doing separated earth oxides. And these process, processes are very complicated generally, and they require a lot of capex and a lot of reagents. A typical um, capex for, for a hard rock deposit, if you look at the numbers and feasibility studies around the world, they're talking roughly anywhere between 400 million to 800 million dollars. At Palabora, we firmly believe we're going to be below 200 million dollars of capex, purely because we don't need to go through as many steps as a normal rare earth project has. What's also very critical about the Palabora asset is that the gypsum sits in chemical form. Now, as you can see on this table here, once you go through various steps, you come to what's known as the cracking of the reagent. So you crack your rare earth mineral into a chemical form. This has already happened at Palabora because as a result of Sassel's um, phosphoric acid production, they threw a lot of sulfuric acid and heat, two key ingredients in the cra cracking process of rare earths, and basically the rare earths on crack chemical form on the gypsum stacks already. So we only have to start, with, we're starting with a crack form, so two thirds of our flow sheet is already taken care of us at no cost to Rainbow. And I think just logically you can see why we believe this will be a, a low capital intensity project and very low um, from an OPEX point of view. Um, my technical director and myself, we work together at MDM. Dave designed and built over 80 process plants in his career. I did 22 plants at MDM and mines around Africa. So we've got a sense of, of what capital numbers should look like and we know how to build plants and we think we are we know we've got a good project here. And very key, we don't have uranium and thorium removal because we've got very, very low grades of radioactivity in our project. Another key thing about this, we're talking about sustainability and the green revolution. The gypsum stacks in Palabora are also a very big ESG project because there's, um, there's a big EIA liability sitting on those stacks that Sassel owns because there's, there's, um, there's um, acid water on these stacks. When we retreat this gypsum, we'll be neutralizing that water we will redeposit re the clean benign gypsum on an IFC compliant um, stack, new stack, and it's basically an ESG cleanup, um, and it's uh, of, of these two gypsum stacks sitting at Palabora. A couple of months ago, we were able to sign a, another key thing for Rainbow, which is the, um, uh, the separation uh, technology from KTEC in, in America. KTEC have uh, developed what they call continuous ion exchange and continuous ion chromatography, which was developed originally, well, it evolved originally from uh, continuous ion exchange, uh, well, sorry, batch ion exchange during the Manhattan Project in the Second World War. They used this technology to separate uranium for the nuclear program at the time, and that developed into continuous 
on an exchange and the guys at KTEC who have been involved in this for over 30 or 40 years also then developed this into continuous iron chromatography and what this allows is it allows us to go and target the, the individual rare earth oxides in the solution at Palabora and produce separated rare earth oxides which is to get the full benefit of, of, of the value of, of, of the pricing you see in the rare earth market at the moment if you produce a mixture of carbonate you're getting about 65 percent of the value of the of, of the metal content and uh, of the rare earths by going into separated rare oxides we go up to about 90 percent so it's a big kicker for us as well and um, the fact that uh, it is IP and it, uh, but it has been tried and tested in, in other areas. They commercially applied this in the lysine industry, sugar industry, phosphate industry in America, and they've um, done large, large scale piloting on phosphogypsum in North Africa, very successfully to uh, remove uranium and thorium, and they've also done it at uh, lab scale and bench scale in America, specifically on phosphogypsum for rare earth elements. So the technology is largely de risk, but before we apply it, we will um, uh, build a pilot plant at uh, Palabora to take it from where we are 90, 95, 98% confident to 100% confident that it works. I'm just footprinting uh, Rainbow's two projects here against other projects in the world. As you can see, our new linear presidium compared to other iron clay deposits are through the roof uh, for reasons I've mentioned. And we look at the car, our hard rock deposit in Burundi, which I'll talk about briefly. You can see our grade, it's a very, very high grade hard rock deposit. We've been trial mining there for a couple of years now, consistently producing a very, very high rare earth and concentrate grade, one of the highest in the world is about 54 to 56%. But very importantly, we have uh, very low levels of uranium and thorium as well, compared to somebody like Linus, where you see there, their thorium is a big problem for them because at the moment they've been forced to build a new plant in Australia because the Malaysians don't want them dumping their radioactive material in Malaysia like they are doing currently. So they were producing a concentrate in Australia, shipping it to Malaysia, and now they've been forced to, uh, to, to do it all in Australia. Oops, what did I do there? Oh, sorry. These are the two gypsum stacks, as you can see. We, um, we are that's also a ferric acid plant. All that infrastructure is available to Rainbow, so offices, admin buildings, everything. That's about 20% of your capital cost as well that we are saving by, by doing the deal that we did with uh, Bosfeld. High voltage switch yard, switch yard sits over here for grid power. Um, there's two rail sidings operating in the site and it's on can maintenance. So that phosphoric plant hasn't worked for seven years. But importantly, it sits in the middle of a mining town, well established mining town in South Africa, with uh, you know, great road servicing it. Airport five minutes away, centre of the town five minutes away, and lots of OEM suppliers on our doorstep. You know, for example, Warm and Wear, who are one of the biggest suppliers of pumps to mining plants around the world, they've got a depot 80 metres from our from our front gate. You know, so um, very very um, good infrastructure surrounding this project, and obviously skilled local labour. We don't have to bring, don't have to train people because there's three operating mines that have been around for 60 odd years and it's got a natural school base sitting on your doorstep there which is also another big advantage I believe for our project. Here you can see some of that infrastructure that's available to us, you know, there's the high voltage switch yard, these are the storerooms and workshops that are still there with a whole bunch of motors that we'll have access to if we need them. There's a laboratory that, uh, that we'll be just refitting for our own um, process and here's a pilot plant that Sassel built. Another reason why people always say, you know, fossil gypsum can you extract the rare earths successfully. Um, Cecil produced three tons of a mixed rare earth uh, carbonate about eight years ago when they built a pilot plant, substantial pilot plant. This three tons of mixed rare earth carbonate was then um, sold to the Japanese. So we know um, it is extractable, and uh, we're at the moment of optimizing that Cecil flow sheet with the new RP that's around. Similar for example the KTEC technology and uh, we believe that uh, we're going to have a far better flow sheet than what Sassel had but we know it works, we're just optimising it. Going to Gukara and Burundi quickly, um, here we have uh, 39 square kilometres of a mining licence, we've been mining for uh, trial mining for about uh, three and a, two and a half, three years, I got, I got involved in the company just two years ago now and I then changed, um, these guys um, were basically um, mining um, what I call artisanal mining on steroids, but I'll get to that. Here we have a very, very big, as I said, big license area. And the beauty about this is we're not looking for a deposit. We've got 57 targets, all of them mineralized. There are seven Belgian mines, historical Belgian mines within our mine license area that are 
uh, Mark, oops, uh, uh, sort of uh, Mark uh, over there. We have 57 targets. These are some of our key targets that we, we need to drill there to take this resource and to give us sort of 10 to 15,000 tons of production per annum for about a 15 or 20 year mine life. We know the resources there, we just got to drill it. It was never drilled before I got involved in the project. And the intention is to use the cash flow from the trial mining operation, free cash flow that we believe we're going to generate once we get mining again. And I'll, I'll come to that. As you can see, pre-2020, these guys were using yellow pit to, and artisanal sort of, um, uh, uh, to physically, with um, picks and shovels to dig out the high grade road veins, change the mining method to a more conventional open pit style. Our production has been uh, increasing steadily um, over the last sort of 18 months until in June this year, we just as we got into cash flow positive territory, um, the Burundi government stopped us mining. The Burundi government wants to renegotiate the mining convention. We've seen this um, uh, in Africa, Chile, Peru, same problems with, with governments when they get involved looking at mining companies. And there's nothing, nothing unusual. We've seen it in Tanzania, we've seen it in the DRC, we've seen it in lots of uh, African countries, unfortunately, where the governments want to change the rules once you're in there. But we do have a good relationship. The government has told us they want a win-win situation. They want us back mining as soon as possible again. And I'm due, we are engaging with the government. I've got a letter from the Minister of Mines last month setting out a timetable, which to the latter half of uh, November, I'm expecting to uh, the timetable from the government uh, as per the letter, which will set out our, our dates for our negotiations and we can come to the so-called win-win situation. They want to change the, um, the free carry percentage, I know. Um, but you know, at the moment, we're seeing a 10% as a free carry for the government and you know, they're, they're looking next door at Tanzania is at 16%. You know, we'll have to see where we get to negotiations. But it will be a negotiation and we will get there and we will start mining again. Obviously, we're very proud of our, our safety record. Um, you know, no LTRs, uh, for a million odd hours, um, and uh, we do a lot of community engagement, as mining companies have to do in these countries, and we are always focusing on, on trying to improve where we can and help the local community, yeah, as you can see. Well, I think that's it.